<clears throat> okay, uh, today we're looking at the Cuban Missile Crisis, what it meant for international relations, in particular for US foreign policy, but also what it meant for um, the subfield of foreign policy analysis for international relations. Now, if you look at the crisis, the crisis started once U-2 uh, surveillance flights uh, showed these particular uh, pictures. Uh, these particular uh, photos indicated uh, that the Soviets had, uh, or rather were in the process of installing medium-range ballistic missiles and intermediate-range ballistic missiles. Uh, this created uh, a huge change to the status quo uh, in, as far as the nuclear balance was concerned. It put the US, continental United States, within uh, reach uh, of uh, these uh, ballistic missiles a uh, very, very uh, quick time. Uh, once they had been installed, they would have reached anywhere in the United States. So this was unacceptable uh, to the leadership uh, under the Kennedy administration uh, and something had to be done in order uh, to uh, for the Soviets to remove these missiles. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis is important and, and fascinating because we have so much information, so many declassified documents on what the decision making was. And this is really the beginning of foreign policy analysis that we have this insight uh, and uh, we really see what's going on at the sub-state level because realists see states as just acting and reacting you know power is everything states are just interested in power and they're like it's like a pool table you hit the ball and that ball hits another one so it's an action and reaction foreign policy analysis and you could say that you know a lot of this course uh, post 370 is within the field of foreign policy analysis looks really the nitty-gritty of what's happening uh, inside a government so um, the United States government uh, formed XCOM XCOM was the executive committee uh, different members of the cabinet uh, they had different options one was airstrike you know, use of force to destroy those missiles. And the second one was a blockade. Now, blockade is still an act of war in international law, uh, so uh, it was called a quarantine uh, of Cuba. Um, Moscow sent, uh, the, the Kremlin uh, sent two letters to the Kennedy administration, Moscow 1 and Moscow 2. Moscow 1, the first letter was uh, the, um, the offer that the solution ought to be based that the Soviets will withdraw uh, the missiles uh, in exchange the United States would pledge publicly that it would never uh, seek anything to overthrow the Cuban government, which of course it had been trying to do, Bay of Pigs fiasco, you know, prior to, the, uh, prior to that. So we have this um, history of violence between Cuba and the United States. The second letter uh, came later, uh, again from the uh, Soviets, uh, it added another contingency or another condition. It was a quid pro quo uh, saying that we will withdraw uh, the uh, missiles in exchange for the United States to withdraw the Thor and Jupiter missiles from Turkey. That was, you know, NATO ally, NATO missiles. Um, the way the Kennedy administration reacted was one, of course, it, uh, inst you know, uh, engaged uh, in the uh, blockade and the uh, embargo. And it only answered to the first letter. It pretended the second letter had never arrived. It only answered uh, to the first letter. However, um, uh, Bobby Kennedy, the uh, you know, brother of JFK and the Attorney General, uh, made a quiet uh, private assurance uh, to the Russian, to the Soviet ambassador in, in Washington, D.C., that within six months uh, they would withdraw those missiles. Uh, but would deny publicly uh, that there was no linkage to that. So this was the, you know, the crisis in a nutshell. Um, everybody applauded John F. Kennedy after it happened that he prevented the Third World War effectively. So there was lots of praise. Um, in the 70s, uh, a very influential book came out by Graham Allison, The Essence of Decisions. And um, that really drew on all of the classified doc declassified documents on the Cuban Missile Crisis, which at that point had been available. And he gives us three, three models. The rational actor model, which is basically what makes most realists say that governments are rational units and they you know, engage in a sort of calculation process and uh, the best possible um, alternative course of action they will pick. The second, uh, this organizational process model that the focus here is on outputs rather than acts or choices. So basically that different agencies in the government in the government have certain procedures, standard operating procedures, which they implement, more or less regardless of what the policy is. These are the things we do. These are our rules of engagement, the military. Uh, these are you know our procedures we have 
at Homeland Security, at the FBI, at the CIA, at State Department. The third model is bureaucratic politics, and that gives it a lot, um, uh, a picture of which uh, politics, and sorry, policy is really subject to bargaining between departments, that rather than a unified government, you have all these different agencies who actually bargain, uh, negotiate uh, over uh, what uh, policy they ought to choose. So let's look at the first one, a rational actor model. So again, act, action, Action is chosen in response to uh, strategic problems the nation faces. If a nation performed a particular action, that nation must have had ends toward which the action constituted an optimal means. So this is again what Graham Allison writes in the book, The Essence of Decision. The conclusion, if you apply this to the nuclear, to the Cuban Missile Crisis, a stable nuclear balance reduces the likelihood of nuclear attack, and a stable nuclear balance increases the probability of a limited war. If you look at the missiles uh, in Cuba, as far as the Soviets were concerned, they were there to rectify the imbalance in missile capacity. Um, the blockade was the only rational um, course of action the United States government could have done, uh, and the situation was diffused. However, uh, because uh, uh, Allison saw these documents for the first time in, in the mid-70s, we we there was obvious there were glitches, anomalies uh, in it. This will lead us to the second model. So the second model is uh, really that government is like a conglomerate of semi-feudal, loosely allied organization. They have their own life, they do what they think they can do best, uh, and, and coordination is really done through the use of standard operating procedures. So again, policy is the output of organizational processes and behaviors determined by previously established procedures. So here, um, each organization does what it uh, does what it, they, they do best, or at least they think they do best. Um, I like to use the, the Star Trek uh, um, comparison here, analogy rather, uh, the Borg, you know, resistance is futile, that we will assimilate you. So again, this is what these uh, agencies do. We have a brand new situation, a brand new problem. How can we assimilate that? Meaning, what sort of standard operating procedures, what sort of routines do we have which are coming close to that new problem, and we can use uh, for that uh, you know, to solve that particular issue. So again, the primary inference from this model, the standard operating procedures model or the organizational process model, if a nation performs an action today, its organizational components must yesterday have been performing an action only very different from this action. So again, SOPs here are not far-sighted; they're not flexible solution. You could say that's why bureaucracies have a bad uh, reputation. So let's some examples of this model. So again, the state is still a unitary actor, but uh, it's not less a chess play, it's more like a quarterback. Just like a quarterback has certain routines, certain tactical maneuvers uh, uh, at uh, his or her disposal, uh, and uh, they will have to rely on these particular standard operating procedures. Now, what sort of models uh, did we have? Well, one is um, looking at uh, the, uh, the, the Soviets. Decision to, to go to Cuba wasn't some sort of grand strategy. It was sort of a snowballing of you know different uh, different ministries, different services had this idea. Um, so it really was a you know a, a snowball rather than this grand scheme, grand strategy. Uh, looking at uh, the U.S. Um, after the Bay of Pigs fiasco, JFK wanted a very strong response rather than diplomatic. So there was you know great mistrust of what the CIA uh, had uh, to. Uh, um, had to counsel uh, to uh, to JFK. JFK. Um, the standard operating procedures by the military they were uneasy about a blockade. One is you know it, it wouldn't send the right signals, so the Soviets it certainly wouldn't get the missiles out which were already in place in Cuba. Um, DEFCON was uh, DEFCON increase was problematic. A DEFCON again is um, how ready you are to actually go to nuclear war, and it really signaled the U.S. intent to escalate it. Uh, Kennedy was very careful about actually taking control and reining in these SOPs. So after the uh, the blockade uh, was authorized, uh, he actually did override some of these procedures. Uh, um, meaning that you know ships were not allowed to actually take uh, shoot uh, at any of the Soviet vessels if they were to have violated uh, the um, uh, the uh, blockade. So again, Kennedy didn't make an independent choice. He studied the options available. 
uh, chose one and, and reined in the contingencies laid out by the SOPs, really wanted to uh, remain, retain as much control as possible. Some of the other Soviet uh, SOPs uh, was a huge premium on secrecy. Uh, you know, obviously, you want to shield your secrets from the, from the Americans, but even within the establishment, the political and military establishment, uh, nobody really was in charge of what was happening. A very good uh, example of this lack of coordination between different services, KGB and military intelligence. So they were in charge of shipping and unloading of the missiles. But once they were on Cuba, once they were on site, the strategic rock services took over. So that's the command which then would fire missiles against uh, the United States. They were not camouflaged. The surface-to-air missiles were installed after the medium-range ballistic missiles. So the surface-to-air missiles are the ones protecting the nuclear missiles uh, from American attacks. The problem was that the surface-to-air missile batteries were, again, under a different command. They were under the Air Defense Command which proceeded independently from the IRBM and M MRBM side. So again, uh, one of the, uh, you know, the, the only uh, fatality of the Cuban Missile Crisis was a U-2 a pilot who was shot down uh, by the Soviets. That could have triggered an actual uh, nuclear war had the United States retaliated uh, with uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons. But that was because the Soviet surface-to-air missile, the Air Defense Command, their job was to defend those ballistic missiles against any enemies. The U-2 flight was seen uh, as you know, a threat to them. That's why they shot them down. So again, it was not the intent of the Soviet Union leadership uh, to uh, you know, start a nuclear war, but it, they could have done because of these standard operating procedures. That would lead me to the third model. And this is where you stand, it depends on where you sit. If you're the Secretary of State, if you're Attorney General, if you're Secretary of Defense, uh, you have different ideas of what you ought to do. You have loyalty. You have loyalty to your diplomats, to your agents, uh, to your armed forces. You know, it depends where you sit, uh, really, is uh, what sort of uh, policy you are uh, advocating. And that is exactly what happened uh, in uh, uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, that you had uh, this... Um, competitive game between uh, different agencies, different departments, all of which you know, were uh, battling uh, over having their consent or the approval of uh, uh, the president. So again, if a nation performed an action, that action was the outcome of bargaining among individuals and groups within the government. You can see here that certainly is a, um, a lack of, uh, of unity here. Now again, what? how did this third model apply to Cuban Missile Crisis? Well, one is Special operations, uh, the, the operational plan and the military uh, for that blockade was actually developed by the DoD for West Berlin. So of a Soviet blockade of Berlin. And then it was basically applied uh, to uh, Cuba. Um, given the context in which the executive committee uh, was operating, we had you know, the Soviet pledge, we had John F. Kennedy's promise to keep offensive weapons out. A failure to act would have likely left, led the administration's demise. So again, we had this very young president. He really had to, he had to earn his stripes in, in foreign policy terms. Something um, substantial had to be done uh, to um, get those missiles out from, from Cuba. But different actors uh, in the administration had different, uh, different policy advice, different counsel. Uh, Chiefs uh, of Staff, uh, the, um, Joint Chief of Staff, Taylor LeMay, very different mindset. They pledged for invasion. They had this very military mindset. You know, certainly they wanted to make up for the Bay of Pigs fiasco. Uh, CIA under McCohn, again, he advocated forceful action. Uh, Mongoose uh, was a secret operation by the CIA, which was basically a you know a series of sabotage attempts uh, in, in 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 Cuba. Uh, again, they wanted to um, make up for for that failure. Department of State under under Dean Rusk, uh, he had diplomatic concerns. You know, he was the original advocating of, of going to Castro him, himself. Uh, there was um, you know a lot of uneasiness about how this would play out at the United Nations, how this would play out with, with allies, and of course what what message it would send uh, to the Soviets. Uh, Senator, Secretary of Defense McNamara, he said you know the strategic balance was uh, unaffected. There was no need to risk uh, for war over a meaningless move. Uh, there was a channel concern uh, as far as McNamara was concerned with uh, the defense situation at large. Um, so the blockade really was seen uh, as 
uh, you know, a compromise between different uh, diff different agents. And after that um, uh, you know, decision was made to actually have a blockade, as I said earlier, Kennedy, uh, you know, went to great length to still rein in any sort of standard operating procedures, which could have jeopardized uh, his his idea of a very non-coercive uh, uh, intervention. Um, so it was the you know compromise between harsh action, which would have which would show resolve, and then an inaction, which would show weakness. So this was the blockade was you know had this had this compromise um, was still met by resistance by both hawks uh, and doves, uh, and even when chosen. Uh, Kennedy had to decide whether the blockade would be used as a negotiating tool, that's what Rusk and Sorensen uh, wanted, or be followed by an ultimatum, so remove the missiles or face uh, uh, further action, and then the ultimatum approach eventually you know, won out, and, and that what was adopted. Um, what the big deal about the Cuban Missile Crisis is that it, it really reorientated this entire international relations scholarship to what we now call the subfield of FPA, foreign policy uh, analysis. Uh, that you know we have the significance of procedures, bureaucratic processes, personalities, perceptions, misperceptions, you know, bargaining between different departments. And, you know, this whole uh, black box, what realists like to think that governments are, was not the case. There was a lot happening, and it it also showed that in, in crucial instances. Both leaders, both in the Kremlin and the White House, um, allowed room for retreat from exposed positions. So they allowed uh, the the enemy to retreat and de-escalate the situation. So uh, again, this was the brinkmanship I mentioned in the earlier uh, lecture. That you know, uh, you give room for retreat. You, you you know, you raise the risk of sh the shared risks of war but you also give room uh, for uh, either to retreat from this exposed uh, position. Um, I highly encourage you to watch the movie uh, 13 uh, Days with Kevin Costner. Uh, it's a um, very, very uh, uh, a good movie on the Cuban Missile Crisis. It, it really gives helps you a lot with getting that mindset. Uh, for the assignment, uh, I would like you to go on a canvas, uh, look at, at several of the um, uh, declassified documents and upload a two-minute video of how uh, you would advocate where you, the Secretary of State, Attorney General, um, the Secretary of uh, Defense, uh, CIA Director, uh, how would you advocate uh, to Kennedy at the time? What was the overall um, uh, knowledge assessment? What was the advice to the President? So there's more uh, on Canvas. Uh, that is the assignment uh, for uh, this particular module.